Well, it, no, it's all fructose. Fructose is fructose. So, it, you know, it's it's very similar to glucose. It's got the same number of uh, of atoms in it. They're just structured slightly differently. And we know a lot about glucose metabolism because it, you know, it's been studied for you know hundreds of years or hundred years. But our understanding of the metabolism of fructose only actually came definitively described by Luke Tappy, uh, who's a Swiss guy, in 2011. So it's brand new, the information around it. We've sort of had some understanding over the last 30 or 40 years, but my textbooks, which are, well, okay, 40 years old, 35, 40 years old, actually barely scratch the surface of fructose metabolism. And even the current textbooks, which are taught to medical students, barely touch upon it. Fructose is completely and utterly metabolized differently to glucose. And so sugar, the sugar molecules, half glucose, half, half fructose. Whether or not you get that fructose from high fructose corn syrup or you get it from honey or you get it from fruit, it's all exactly the same molecule. Fructose, in summary, is a small amount converted to glycogen, which goes to our restored muscle. The vast majority of it is passed is metabolized in the liver on first pass. So the body doesn't like it getting from the blood, the gut into the bloodstream. It goes from the gut straight to the liver, metabolized very, very quickly. And there's some new work coming out suggesting it may be metabolized slightly differently in a few other structures, but effectively most of it goes straight to the liver, metabolized there. Small amount goes down an aldehyde pathway, which gets converted, which is effectively an alcohol pathway. A small amount is going to get turned into you know, as a glass of red wine, but that is an alcohol pathway. Too much, and that's how we make out alcohol. You, you ferment fruit, and it's the fermentation of the fructose gets converted to the alcohol. Whether or not you have that in a, in a glass of red wine or you have it in your liver doesn't really matter. It's the same pathway. Another portion goes towards uric acid production. There's an enormous amount of work about uric acid. Uric acid is a byproduct of fructose metabolism. It's the thing commonly heard of with gout, but it's a huge cornerstone in the inflammation pathway nitric oxide opens up your blood vessels to control our blood pressure it controls the blood flow to our brain and it controls our immunity uric acid inhibits nitric oxide function so if you have too much fructose you'll produce uric acid uric acid will in fact affect our blood pressure affect our brain blood flow and affects our uh, our um, immune system so a lot of people nowadays have hypertension, high blood pressure. Literally, by dropping their sugar intake, they reduce their blood pressure within days. Literally. So that's the practical side of it. The practical side, cut out your sugar, your blood pressure will come down literally within that days and you'll need to come off medications or at least think about reducing them. That mechanism is via uric acid. Another pathway that, that fructose travels down is then in, into the production of fat because the excess is converted to fat, which happens in nature. If you eat fruit as an animal and you gorge upon it, you're doing it to get fat for winter, hibernation. Again, that's it. It's a simple mechanism. In nature, fruit drives behaviour and it will go down that pathway of fat production. Some of that fat production actually then goes down in the end pathway to small dense LDL particles. LDLs are a lipoprotein, how we transport fat and protein in the bloodstream. The current understanding is that the small dense LDL particles, this is not the topic of cholesterol, the small dense LDLs, when they become oxidized and in which then they're the ones which are made a major association and likely cause of inflammation. So if you can actually cut down your fructose then you cut down your small dense ldl production then they're not there to be oxidized and as a result of that you reduce your inflammation fructose will go and um, inhibit leptin and again i'm using some terms here leptin is a, a hormone produced by the fat in our bodies so if you've got plenty of leptin on plenty of fat and board the body produces leptin and it says don't don't eat fructose breaks that pathway so it actually at, at, that's at a hypothalamic level inside the brain. And actually, so therefore fructose will make you hungry. It will also stimulate a hormone called ghrelin, which is secreted by the stomach, which is the one which actually gives you that rumbling stomach. When you're hungry, you'll get, oh, I've got a rumbly stomach. It's almost, it's 
triggered all through the vagus nerve. And as a result of that, you then feel hungry. So fructose, whether wherever it comes from, will drive certain behaviours. Number one, it will make you hungry. Number two, it will make you lethargic because of its alcohol. Three, it will make you agitated by the uric acid because your blood pressure will go off. You'll get a bit uh, 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 excited in that situation. And third, and then finally, it'll actually have this whole effect via uh, uh, the fat metabolism and fat storage. Uh, Richard Johnson uh, is a nephrologist who studied this significantly, the role of uric acid in hibernation. And he'll actually look at, you know, as our as an animal in hibernation, and I'm summarising a lot of Richard's work here in a short bit, so apologies, Richard, if you ever hear this. In hibernation, as you get towards the end of hibernation, you've burnt out in your fat stores, the body starts breaking down protein. One of those side effects is uric acid. Uric acid goes up and then actually it starts agitating and then you wake up out of hibernation. Fructose in fruit which is the natural source the natural source of fructose is fruit and a small and honey fruit in nature will drive behavior and you can see that in the animal kingdom here in australia we've got uh, possums which will literally come and strip a fruit tree bare two days before you actually want to eat it you know that and so they and they can't possibly eat that amount of fruit but they do they literally gorge themselves on it because they're getting fat but it's the fructose and the uric acid which is actually driving that the pathway to actually continue on. And so animals in the wild will just eat fruit until they can't eat anymore or they strip the tree bare, but it's a survival mechanism. Now, we as humans go down through the same pathway, so it's a very addictive pathway. It's actually uh, we talked about that it stimulates dopamine in the addiction centre of the, of the brain, um, a place called the nucleus accumens. It's just fascinating to watch. Like sugar is 50% fructose, 50% glucose. Fruit, depending on the different forms, will have varying amounts of fructose and glucose, but it's, you know, it's roughly 50-50. Honey is about 55 to 45% glucose. That's why honey is sweeter than fruit. And high fructose corn syrup is in that same vicinity of 55-45. If you want to eat it, that's fine. However, you should understand that it's going to drive behaviour and it's going to have side effects. And if you want to eat fructose, understand you should be having it seasonally. If you're eating it, it should be having fresh and local and it should be seasonal. But understand it will make you hungry. So in season, I will have some berries, but I'll have them at night so that the hunger that it actually triggers for me, and when I'm saying some, I'll have three or four. You know, well, you know, I'm completely addicted. But okay, I like that sweetness, but I'll have it later, you know, in the evening so that I sleep off the hunger. But if I have that for breakfast, then I'm going to be hungry through the course of the day. And you, you, you watch watch people with a bowl of grapes in front of them, a bowl of cherries. They can't eat one. You ever seen that? People can't, you can't, if I give you a bowl of fruit, it's really hard just to have one. The high fructose corn syrup, you know, who developed that? Do you know that one? The Japanese actually sold that technology to the US. The high fructose corn syrup industry took off largely related to corn subsidies and farming issues and financial ties, but that technology was actually sent to the US. Um, and, you know, in a really cynical sort of way, who's actually won the war now? You know, like we've got a whole society in the US and large places around the world that are addicted to sugar and fructose. We've created this scenario now where People are carb aware, carbohydrate aware. I, I thought, okay, we've, we, we've said carbs are, you know, are, are troublesome. So the net, the long short of it is there is no single human biochemical pathway that requires carbohydrate. So we actually require zero carbohydrate in our diet to survive. We need to have essential fats in our diet. We need to have essential proteins. We need to have essential vitamins and minerals. But there's not a single pathway that we require to eat glucose or fructose or combinations thereof, which becomes all the galactoses and the maltoses and, and dextroses. But effectively, we don't actually need it. 
So if there's actually no pathway that require that we require to survive, then it becomes a luxury item. And it is a luxury item. So fruit in nature is a luxury item. You know, if you're an animal, you come across it seasonally and you will gorge upon that luxury item so you can get fat for winter. And in society, fruit is a luxury item. I come, come back, coming back to Japan, I don't know if you've ever been there. They cherish fruit. So an apple, you know, it will be served in an entire box and it will be extremely expensive. But it is seen as a precious special item. It's not a mass-produced chemically uh, you know uh, uh, chemically managed um, hybridized fruit that we have now so the fruit of history was small tiny wasn't nearly as sweet as it is now and, if, and the, one of the reasons is we've we've hybridized fruit it's been genetically modified whether or not it's just con- you know not maybe genetically modified in in the laboratory, or even though certain strains are, but it is in fact now lower in fibre and higher in sugar, and it is like that because it actually drives market share, and it improves shelf life and it improves profitability. The the, the more sugar you have in the food, the longer it will last. You take the extreme example, which is the wedding cake, which is you know the fruit mince wedding cake, which is very very high in sugar. You can keep that piece of wedding cake and still eat it for your ten year wedding anniversary. And it markets, and and then the, the system, you know, the market the marketplace now advertises it being oh, rich in potassium and rich in you know, um, uh, you know in micronutrients and phytonutrients and, and and everything underneath the sun. However, you get all of those from animal-based product an animal-based product is going to be rich in uh, the essential vitamins the essential micronutrients the the essential mineral uh, uh, proteins the essential fats and the animal-based product is very low in carbohydrate and that's the way we evolve we are here because we have a carnivore basis and we are omnivores i think for survival you know, it's like you actually, we, we, uh, our primary requirements are animal based, but we will graze upon plant based foods when we can't get our animal based ones. So, you know, we, we survive with a plant based diet and we thrive on an animal based diet. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, people think that's a controversial statement. No, it's frigging biochemistry. And that's, that's all my arguments that, you know, tend to be it's, this is biochemistry. I'm not, I'm not making that stuff up. And there's no, and the, the Krebs cycle, which is a basic part of human, of, of, of physiology, whether or not you're an animal or a human or an insect, is how we turn our food into energy, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And we get it, and it can be done via protein, fats, and carbohydrates. And God, you know, God's, whichever, you know, God with a little G or a big G or whichever, whatever you believe in, God wasn't stupid enough to make us chemically dependent on a seasonal food source. God's given us the ability to actually utilise whatever is available in nature to give us energy to get from A to B. And that's called the Krebs cycle. The luxury item in that, the seasonally available ones, sugar and carbohydrate. But it comes at a price that it creates inflammation. Oh, the other thing about the seasonality and fructose is that fructose, the byproduct is that small dense LDL particle which gets into the blood vessel wall. That is cleared by macrophages called foam cells to get them out of that the wall and they're un- under the direct influence of vitamin D. So. Guess when fruit's actually seasonally available? It's normally the end of summer, beginning of uh, beginning of autumn. And so if you want to eat it at that point in time, there's generally an abundant amount of sunlight around, so you're going to have good amounts of vitamin D to actually get rid of the inflammation. We are not meant to be eating fructose in the middle of winter when we don't have sun. So our vitamin D levels drop down. So I think we get more inflamed through winter by eating sugar 
And I don't know if that's a contributing cause to that, you know, the winter blues, you've got them in Canada, you know, similar latitude north as we are south. You know, at the end of winter, everyone's got the blues. And is it because their vitamin D levels are down or is it because their vitamin D levels are down and their inflammation levels are higher? 